I'm delighted to be speaking with Dr. Marisa Linton from Kingston University in London. Marisa is uh, one of the eminent historians of the, uh, of the French Revolution. An earlier book was called The Politics of Virtue in Enlightenment France, a study of a key concept in uh, Enlightenment thinking and also in thinking during the, the French Revolution. Most recently she published a book with the intriguing title of Choosing Terror and it's that that I'm going to be uh, discussing with Dr Linton uh, now. So uh, Marisa, how would you summarise the key arguments of Choosing Terror? Okay, uh, well, um, I started with a premise which was why should somebody like Robespierre, who started out as a humanitarian, an idealist, a man who was opposed to the death penalty, which he thought was barbaric, why should such a man choose terror at a certain point in the revolution? How did that come about? There have been many ways in which people have tried to explain that, uh, talking about it in terms of, of hypocrisy or, or paranoia, all sorts of things that are sort of centered on Robespierre himself as an individual. But I thought it was about much more than one individual's journey. It was the journey of many people. And so from asking that initial question, I wanted to widen out my search to look at other revolutionary leaders and how they were collectively choosing terror. What was that experience like for them? How did they come to do that? So that was how I began, as it were, with, with the quest. Um, and I wanted to approach the subject really from the point of view of seeing them in a very kind of contemporary way as politicians, politicians of their time. And in a sense, what I was arguing is that the French revolutionaries were the first politicians in our modern sense in that they weren't answerable to the king, they were answerable to public opinion. And this was a major, major deal. Everything they did was in the public eye. They had to put on a performance every time they spoke. They had to be very careful and guarded about what they said. And they put on a certain kind of public front and presented themselves in a certain way as men of virtue, men of integrity, uh, morality who put the public good first. They were always thinking of the public good, never thinking of themselves. That was how they were supposed to speak. And that was part of their ideology, their, their public identity. But then behind that, of course, there were other layers of what they were doing. There's a whole sort of layer of um, tactics, political tactics, just as you see in politics today. People maneuver, they make deals, they, they strike accords, they, f they have tactics that they pursue in their clubs, in the assemblies and so forth. So all that kind of politics is going on as well. And then there's another level which I found deeply interesting and that's the personal level of politics. And this is the kind of the unspoken thing, but that's going on as well, that's very important. These are men who have whole complicated personal lives, they have uh, uh, relationships of friendship with one another, sometimes turn into enmity. They have uh, very strong emotions, positive and negative, and these are all part of who they are. So they, they operate on these three levels at once, really as politicians, and that was how I wanted to sort of put that together. It's one of the most interesting themes I found was, uh, was about friendship uh, and the way in which um, the great dilemmas, the great crises of, of that period, 1792 through 1794, can really confront what seem to be close friendships with terrible uh, choices. I mean, the most famous one, I, I suppose, is Robespierre and Danton and Desmoulins, but there are many others, presumably, where friends fall out uh, with fatal consequences. Yes, no, absolutely. And that was something that's, that struck me as I was doing this research into these leaders of the, of the Jacobins, in that um, I was surprised at how close their connections were many of them uh, started out friends. Some of them were friends actually before the revolution. People you wouldn't think, you know, Marat and Briso were friends. <laughs> there was a time before the revolution when those men were friends, which uh, seems to be forgotten. All sorts of people had, had these connections with one another, uh, worked together as colleagues, uh, and yet at a certain point along the way, many of them fell out with one another. And the awful thing about that, I think, is when friends fall out, it's worse than when, when people are always enemies. The, the worst dangers that you face are the ones that come from behind you uh, because your friends know where, know where the bodies are buried, as it were. They know the, how to do the dirty on one another. And particularly when the issue is, as they put it at the time, um, the survival of the French Revolution or death, victory or death, that uh, if friends fall out, it can be fatal. One, 
Um, one of the most powerful um, explanations of the terror, of course, has been the, if you like, the force of circumstance argument, very popular among pro-revolutionary historians, Jacobin historians, Marxist historians, that what we call the terror is really something that's imposed on the National Convention, on the Committees of Public Safety and General Security, on Robespierre and his allies, really by the, the military crisis of 1793, that they really have no choice if the revolution is to survive. Are you saying that that's not a good enough explanation of what happens? The terror has to be explained by many different things. There's no single explanation for why the terror happens. So uh, I think now, nowadays historians are really looking at complex, multiple threads of explanation. The circumstances thesis, what you're outlining there, the, the idea that it was all about defense, it was necessary to defend France, that these terrible things were done. Yes, that, that's an argument that has a long history. Uh, there's a lot about it, I think, that's still very relevant and important because war changes people. Uh, war has a, a deep impact on every layer of the French Revolution. Yes, that's certainly the case, but it doesn't explain everything. And it doesn't explain, I think, some of the levels of fear that the revolutionary leaders were suffering from. And this is what I call the, the politicians' terror when they turn on one another. And this bears uh, only a, a, a marginal relation, really, to the war, because the people they seem to be more afraid of are, are, their, are, their, are their colleagues rather than you know, the enemy, the British or the Prussians or what have you. It's actually their own, their own sort of fellow revolutionaries who seem to be against them. And they link in their minds the, uh, the betrayal of uh, friends um, and colleagues with, 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 uh, with developments uh, uh, abroad so that the people who are the, become their enemies within France are the enemy within. They're supposed to be involved in a conspiracy with, with, with the, foreign, the foreign invaders. So it's linked, but it's something else. It takes on life its own. And fear is a very, very powerful emotion. And you can't see a sort of neat link there necessarily between those fears and what is happening as a consequence of the war. There are other, other impulses there that are very important. Um, you know, it's long been said, you know, why didn't the terror end immediately after the Battle of Fleurus? That's 26th of June, which showed that the, the French forces uh, were winning uh, military victories. Why then did it con terror, uh, continue for another month after that? A month in which many people died, you know, at the height of what they call the Great Terror in Paris. And that really has a lot to do with fear, fear of prison plots, fear of assassination, all sorts of things were going on there. And to use one of the words that's in the subtitle of your book, Choosing Terror, um, how do you know that someone is authentic? How do you know when someone says, I am a patriot, uh, I'm a revolutionary, how can you be sure, finally, that they're telling the truth or are they part of some uh, conspiracy? Are they dissimulating? And I was struck by the link then but with your earlier book about virtue, which is such a, a powerful term, isn't it, right through the 18th century and into the French Revolution, because these are men and some women who, in public life who proclaim that in some sense they are the embodiment of virtue and are creating a society of virtue but how can you tell that they're authentic? And that seems to me to be the great dilemma. Yeah, it, it's really a problem. Uh, we don't use the term virtue now, so perhaps it seems a bit odd, but when people are talking about politics now, they still talk about morality, corruption, uh, duplicity, uh, the demarcation between public and private. So actually, it's not such a very archaic idea, I think. It's something that still continues for us. We worry about our politicians. We worry now about what our politicians are really up to, whether they're ambitious. So we share some of the concerns that the French revolutionaries had. However, when our politicians turn out to have failings, we don't cut their heads off. And that really comes out of the, the circumstances situation where they take it that extra mile, really. Uh, yeah. One, one final question. You referred to the, the Battle of Fleurus in June 1794, which, as you said, is the moment when really the Republic and the Revolution itself are safe from the enemy. The foreign troops have been expelled. And that's the moment where, of course, a, a lot of historians say, if only Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety had been able to chart uh, a pathway back to constitutional government, to peace, they would now be French heroes rather than uh, people who are vilified in, in memory. You're implying, I think, that 
they were incapable, or they would have been incapable of doing that, because by then they'd become embroiled in this uh, nightmare of conspiracy and plots and all the rest of it, that in fact they w would have been unable to wind down the terror, so to speak. I think it's very hard to talk about what might have been always, yeah. but I certainly think the psychological dimensions are very, very important. For a man like Robespierre, yes, I think he's very much someone on the edge uh, by that point, and he is psychologically incapable by that point of turning back. I think that's something that really happens after after he agrees to the uh, the execution of his friends of Danton and Demelin. He takes a certain step, he hardens his views, and he will not step back. It's almost as though he had a kind of death wish um, that, that he couldn't see a way for himself to be other than what he was. And in the end, he becomes a kind of sacrifice which enables the others to, to um, the other revolutionaries, many of them terrorists themselves, to rehabilitate themselves by, by destroying him. Yeah, that does happen. Yes, I, I, and I very much agree. I believe that when Robespierre becomes involved in the, uh, the trial of Danton and Desmoulins, that he uh, has a period of illness immediately after that, that from which he never really recovers psychologically. Um, so I think that's a very powerful argument that you make. And I want to thank you very much for the insights that you've given us. And congratulations on the book, which I understand is also in paperback now. Soon, soon, soon. in paperback, yes. Um, <laughs> as it should be. Thank you very much, Marisa.